to to speak about uh, to speak about this work. Um, uh, yes, so I'm going to be speaking about uh, joint work with um, with Rui Durban. Um, and uh, yes, it's about uh, constructing extremal metrics on on blow ups. So a central theme in, in complex geometry is the search for canonical metrics, such as those of uh, constant scalar curvature. And what I will do in this talk is discuss the construction of uh, of a certain kind of canonical metrics. So they are these, these extremal metrics uh, on the blow up of a manifold in a point. And uh, this problem really has a, a long history of study. So I will also survey some of the previous results before discussing um, the core idea, new ideas that we implemented that allowed us to go a bit further um, in the problem. And uh, this is all joint work with uh, Rui Durban, as I said. Okay, so the beginning of the talk is going to be some kind of more background talk on, uh, on canonical Kähler metrics, and then I will gradually get into the problem that I'm um, discussing today. So throughout X is going to be a compact complex manifold. And so we have a holomorphic structure uh, and that can be encoded in an endomorphism of the tangent bundle, um, which satisfies uh, that J squared is minus the identity. So this is really coming from multiplying by I uh, infinitesimally. So, so we have this, this endomorphism um, called the almost uh, complex structure. And what we want to do is that we want to put uh, Riemannian metrics on this uh, complex manifold uh, that in some way are compatible with, um, with this complex structure that we have. So a Riemannian metric uh, is said to be Hermitian if, uh, J is nice, uh, if J is an isometry. So the length of a vector is the same as the length of J of a vector. Um, so if you plug J into both slots of the Riemannian tensor, you get the, the same value as you did beforehand. And whenever you have a Hermitian metric, um, you can produce a two form uh, from it by just putting J into one of the slots in, instead of both of them. And it's an, a quick computation to show that this then implies that this omega um, that you get from that is, uh, is a two form. And the metric is called Kähler if this is a closed two form. So if this omega satisfies that D omega is equal to zero. So we're, we're interested in Kähler metrics in this talk. And whenever you have a Kähler metric, um, you have this condition. So you then have an associated uh, cohomology class uh, that you get in the second cohomology of X uh, called the Kähler class of the metric. Um, so I will interchange saying of the metric or of the form omega because they determine one, one another. Mm. Um, so this is the Kähler class of, of this data. And uh, now if you have a, another um, Kähler form whose Kähler class is the same topological class, then um, this IDD bar lemma says that you can describe the difference of the two by a function. So there exists a function phi such that omega prime your new method Kähler form is the old one plus IDD bar phi. We use the notation omega subscript phi to mean this new, this omega plus IDD bar phi. Um, so that means that if we fix the Kähler class, we can describe um, all Kähler metrics in that class through functions. Um, all right. And actually, the, the set of functions such that um, this omega plus IDD bar phi is a Kähler form, meaning it is a form coming from a Kähler metric. This is an open um, non-empty subset of uh, the smooth functions on X. So we really have loads of Kähler metrics in a given class once we have one. So um, uh, yeah, the set parameterizes all Kähler metrics in that class. And that's really an infinite dimensional set of Kähler metrics in the, in the given class. So it's a very natural question to ask um, 
if uh, we can find a canonical representative once we have fixed the, the class. So to, to answer that question, we have to really say what we mean by the question. Um, so we, we want to ask ourselves, what is really a good notion of, of a canonical metric? And I think in, in dimension one, there's a pretty, pretty good canonical choice, and that's a, um, a metric of constant uh, curvature. So the uniformization theorem gives a unique metric of constant curvature. And that gives you a good canonical choice in complex dimension one. In higher dimensions, however, there are, uh, you, you would then think that the, it, it should also involve some kind of curvature property, this notion of a canonical metric, but there are many curvature notions. Um, so this would, could lead to many different notions of canonical metrics. So instead of surveying all the different kinds of um, notions you could come up with, I'll just jump straight to the, to the ones that will be relevant for this talk. And both of the ones that I'm talking about today uh, involve the scalar curvature. So from uh, the Riemannian metric, um, you get the, the curvature tensor. And if you, uh, if you average that a couple of times, uh, you get a function on the manifold, uh, the scalar curvature function. So one good notion of um, canonical metrics uh, are those for which this function is a constant. So these are called constant scalar curvature metrics. We want to solve S omega phi equal uh, to, a, to a constant. And this is actually a predetermined constant. But it won't be so important for us what, what it is today. So it's predetermined from the data of the Kähler class and, and the manifold X. Normally, when I talk about uh, this sort of stuff, I would usually just focus on these metrics. Um, but for what I'm saying today, it's kind of important to include uh, a more general type of uh, metric um, than constant scalar curvature ones. And these are um, the ones featuring in the title, so extremal Kähler metrics. So these are due to Calabi in the 80s, and um, they can be defined as follows. So let's let d omega be the following operator. So d omega acts on functions, and it takes a function, and then you compute the gradient with respect to the, to the metric. And that's a section of the tangent bundle and we're on a complex manifold, so we can take the one zero part of this. So there's an uh, isomorphism as smooth bundles from Tx to the one zero part of the complexified tangent bundle. And this is then a section of the holomorphic tangent bundle. So this is a holomorphic uh, tangent bundle. So it has a D bar operator and you can apply D bar to that. This this is second order in, in F. Um, and the kernel consists precisely of the functions so that this um, section of the holomorphic tangent bundle is, uh, is holomorphic. So meaning that this vector field that you get is a holomorphic vector field on X. And now, extremal Kähler metrics are those which land in the kernel of this. So here I should say, if we change omega to omega phi, both the, the d omega and the scalar curvature s omega is going to change. So it's d omega phi s omega phi equal to zero. So you want, um, want it to be this in the kernel of this operator for the new metric omega phi. So what this is saying is that the scalar curvature uh, is a potential for a holomorphic vector field. If we take um, the one zero part of the gradient of the scalar curvature, then this defines a holomorphic vector field uh, on X. Was this, this so, was suggested? Sorry? This was suggested already by Calabi? Uh, yes. So um, 
Kalabi came up with this when he uh, studied um, the energy functional associated to the scalar curvature, meaning the square of the uh, L2 norm. So you do the integral of the scalar curvature squared and you look at the uh, critical points of that. And if you're on a compact manifold, you get this equation out. Huh. So did, yeah. he, did he even produce examples of classes which doesn't admit constant scalar curvature metric when he... Yes, so, so the first example of something like this that he produced, so he produced explicit examples of, of manifolds admitting these metrics, namely Hitzebrook surfaces. So, so on Hitzebrook surfaces that are not P1 times P1, um, you can't have uh, constant scalar curvature metrics, but he produced uh, extremal metrics in, in all Cato classes on, on those manifolds. So they admit extremal metrics, but not uh, constant scalar curvature metrics. Um, yeah. So he used some kind of ansatz to, to create uh, these metrics, because you have a lot of symmetry in that situation. And, um, essentially solving the equation using that ansatz becomes an ODE rather than a PDE, and he was able to solve, uh, solve that PDE. Uh, but yeah, the study of, of this equation maybe comes from already being maybe being motivated by the, the studying constant scalar curvature metrics. It's then natural to look at this functional, which is the square of the, the integrating the square of the scalar curvature. Um, and critical points of that functional are precisely these, uh, these metrics. Um, I'll, I'll also mention another reason for studying these uh, coming kind of from the linearization of the scalar curvature operator. Um, later, even if you start with constant scalar curvature metrics, uh, it's kind of natural to allow extremal metrics in general, but I'll, I'll come to that in a second. Um, yes. So these are the metrics that I'm interested in today. And for a lot of the talk, you can just think of constant scalar curvature metrics. But um, many of the results only apply for extremal metrics. So that means you can't just replace everything by, by constant scalar curvature metrics. So uh, one has to work in this generality, really. Um, but yeah, this is some finite dimensional space instead that you're trying to hit rather than hitting a constant. All right. Um, but it's also kind of a moving target because this d omega depends on omega. So um, uh, yeah, but you, there, there are ways to describe that in a good way. Okay, so um, uh, an important aspect of, of this theory is that the um, existence question is deeply related to uh, algebraic geometry. So what we would like to answer is given uh, Kähler manifold and a, and a Kähler class on it, does that class admit an extremal metric or not? And that question is very, and yeah, you can find examples where you admit it in all Kähler classes, some Kähler classes or none of the Kähler classes. So um, and we, would, we would like to figure out um, when you do. So a central conjecture in the field is the Altian Donaldson conjecture. And this says that the existence of these metrics should be related to Kind of algebra of geometric conditions of stability. And the predominant notion is called case stability, and there are variants of it, but I will be very rough about what this is today. For, for those who are experts, I'm not maybe using exactly the right words, but um, what this, these notions involve is that you have a certain class of degenerations of X called uh, test configurations. To those, you associate a number called uh, the donaldson Tutaki invariant. And then you ask for that number. So case stability asks for that number to always have a particular sign. So that's what's involved in this um, algebra geometric notion. And the conjecture is then that a polarized projective manifold uh, admits a CSEK or extremal metric in the first churn class of L, if and only if it's case stable in the CSEK case or relatively case stable in the extremal case. And there are variants of this when it's not, when you're not in the projective setting and so on, but, um, but maybe I'll, I'll just be happy with 
this now. And um, the bottom line is that it's, it should be captured somehow algebra geometrically, um, even though the question itself is, uh, is solving a PD um, for, for a metric. And, and this has had um, a huge history of, uh, of, of study. Um, okay, so um, the problem that I'm considering today is a perturbation problem, meaning we're gonna start with um, a metric that solves this equation or is close to solving that equation. And then we wanna perturb it in a different setting into, into solving it. So we change the situation slightly and then we want to perturb to actually solving it in a new situation as well. And in those kind of problems, the linearization of the equation is, is really key. So the Lichnerovich operator is the operator you get by, by taking this operator we had when we defined extremal metrics and then using the formal adjoint of it to create a fourth order operator, um, D star D. Um, so D is this operator I defined earlier. And this operator is deeply linked to the um, linearization of the scalar curvature. And moreover, the kernel is precisely those holomorphic potentials. So it's um, potentials for holomorphic vector fields um, on X. Uh, and yeah, the, the, the linearization of the scalar curvature operator is essentially this operator, it's up to, up to a sign and, and the kind of um, term of lower order. Um, but the important thing to take, take from this is that uh, the kernel of this operator here appears uh, in, the, in the study of the extremal equation. And um, Therefore, I will be talking a lot about obstructions and so on coming from holomorphic vector field, fields on X and on the blow up in what's going to come. And the reason I'm doing that is because it is linked to the linearization of the equation, which means it's very much linked to what we can solve at the, how we can perturb at the infinitesimal level. Um, so, so this is why obstructions that I'm talking about is going to be linked to, to holomorphic vector fields on X. All right, so now I want to go a bit into the problem that I'm actually considering today. So um, I'm just going to call it the, the blow-up problem. So uh, first I'm going to say what the blow-up is for those who don't know. Um, so we start with a with really a complex manifold and we pick a point, then one can define the blow up uh, of X in that point. And it's a manifold which satisfies that you have changed nothing outside of um, P, but you have replaced the point with sort of all the directions out of that point. And so the, the pre-image of the point via this map that you have from the blow up to the original manifold it's just a copy of PN minus one called the exceptional divisor. So really the local model uh, here is blowing up uh, CN in the origin. And this consists of the pair of points in PN minus one cross CN so that um, the CN component lies in the line determined by the point in PN minus one. So the CN component is a constant multiple of the PN minus one component. So if you project to the second factor um, uh, there, then this is a biholomorphism away from the origin. So if the, the second factor is non-zero, then the point in PN minus one is predetermined. So um, we have a unique point in this product, um, in, this, in, this, in the blow up. But if we look at the pre-image of zero, then it's, um, it's all of PN minus one because um, that parameterizes the lines through the origin. So the, the origin goes through, is in all of those lines. So what, what we have done is that we've replaced the origin with a copy of PN minus one. And that's the local model for the blow up. Um, and that's, you can do that globally uh, via gluing. 
So this is the manifold that we're interested in constructing uh, extremal metrics on. And we need one more piece of data. So we need to also fix a Kähler class uh, on the blow up. And for that, we need to understand a bit the Kähler cone of the blow up. So meaning the, the kind of Kähler classes you can get on the blow up. So first of all, the, the second cohomology of the blow up changes by adding on uh, the Poincaré dual to the divisor you've added. So we have this exceptional divisor in the, this copy of PN minus one in the manifold and the second cohomology uh, changes by the Poincaré dual to that new sub-manifold, new divisor. And if, um, Omega is a Kähler class on X, then uh, the pullback to the blow up is going to be um, uh, on the boundary of the Kähler cone of the blow up. Uh, every sub variety will have non negative uh, volume, but the exceptional divisor will have zero volume uh, for this class. So, in order to actually get a Kähler class to move into the Kähler cone, you need to give this exceptional divisor a bit of positive volume. And you can do that by subtracting uh, a small um, multiple of this Poincaré dual to the, to the exceptional divisor. So these classes, omega epsilon on the blow up, they will be Kähler for all positive epsilon sufficiently small. And it's in those classes we are going to be interested in um, constructing these extremal Kähler metrics. So yeah, that's a Kähler class on the blow up. So the question then that we're interested in today is under what conditions um, does the blow up admit the CSEK or extremal metric in, in these classes for all epsilon, positive epsilon sufficiently small? And here we're only going to be interested in when epsilon is really, really small, not necessarily all epsilon for which this is Kähler. Um, so you can think of that as when the volume of the exceptional divisor is really, really small. So we are in some sense close to our original manifold. We've only added on this little divisor with very little volume. Um, and in that way, we can think of it as a bit of a perturbation from the original manifold that we had. So now this question has a, has a rich history of study. Um, there are uh, several constructions, uh, constructing extremal metrics on, on the blow up in these classes. And what these constructions, so these are constructions of Eritz Bocard, Eritz Bocard Singer and Sakihidi. And they start with an extremal metric before blowing up and by a gluing construction, constructs new extremal metrics on the, on the blow up. So these give sufficient conditions for the blow up to admit ex these extremal metrics. There are also necessary conditions by taking the, the algebra of geometric point of view um, due to Stoppa uh, originally, and then Stoppa and Sekihiri in the extremal case. And uh, they provide necessary conditions. So in particular, what they show is that if you start with something that is strictly unstable, so in some sense, far away from admitting an extremal metric, then that will also be the case for the blow up. And yeah, I should also mention that there are versions of this for blowing up higher dimensional subvarieties by Sayadali and Sekihidi, and also some work of Ashimoto. But um, today we are focusing on just blowing up a point. And the, the strongest result in the point case uh, is due to Sekihidi, who completely settled a YTD correspondence in the C CSEK case when the dimension is at least two. So saying that it's exactly captured by an algebra geometric um, criterion and saying what that algebra geometric criterion is in this case. So um, I'm gonna go a bit deeper into these um, constructions just to say exactly what was known before our result. And then I will uh, state what the main result is. So the first case is when the automorphism group of the original manifold is um, discrete. So you, the, the assumptions by Aritz Picard um, are that X admits the CCK metric in this class omega and that the automorphism group in discrete is discrete. And in that case, any point will do in the construction, meaning um, 
if you pick x in that way and pick any point, then for all sufficiently small epsilon, the blow up admits a CSEK metric uh, in these classes, making the, the volume of the exceptional divisor really small. This class is omega epsilon. So there are no uh, restrictions on, on the point. Um, any will do. But this changes when the automorphism group is non-trivial. So when, when the connected component of the automorphism group is, um, is non-zero. So the simplest case is when uh, you pick the point to be fixed by um, a maximal torus in the um, reduced automorphism group of, of X. In that case, there are still no obstructions provided you allow extremal metrics. So if you start with a CSEK metric, it might be that you have to allow for an extremal metric, but uh, that's all you need to do. So you will always be able to produce an extremal metric starting either from a CSEK or extremal metric. Uh, and the key really to, to understanding why there are, um, uh, there's no obstruction in this case is that all of kind of this action of the of the maximal torus lifts in this case? So the all the relevant holomorphic vector fields will lift, and um, the extremal equation is is then kind of unobstructed at the linearized level uh, in this case. So yeah, just to summarize what what this construction is. So both by Aritz Bakard Singer and Sekihidi using kind of slightly different constructions. Suppose X admits an extremal metric in, in a given class and pick a point fixed under the action of a maximal torus in the reduced automorphism group of X. Then for all sufficiently small epsilon, the blow up admits an extremal metric uh, in these classes that we're considering. So there the construction still works um, and we can always construct an extremal metric in these classes. So what happens if, um, if this is not the case? So if the point is not fixed by a maximal torus, then the, the, the real issue comes in. So that's where you actually see an obstruction to solving the equation. Um, and it might be that you can't. So um, the core reason for this can really be understood from the linear theory. So, um, the, automorphism, the reduced automorphism group of the blow up can be seen as uh, a sub uh, group of the reduced automorphism group of X. And it's really the subgroup generated by the vector fields that vanish at the blown up point. And uh, remember I said that the linearization of the scalar curvature is very related to, sorry, um, to holomorphic vector fields. Uh, the kernel of the linearization um, is generated by, by the potentials for these kind of vector fields. So what we're seeing here is that if we are blowing up a point which is not fixed um, by this maximal torus, then there's going to be a discrepancy between these two things, which means also that there's a discrepancy between the mapping properties of the linearized operator before and after we blow up. And that's really the core reason at, on the analytic level why, why um, sort of the construction is obstructed uh, in the case when you blow up a point not fixed uh, by a maximum torus. So yeah, uh, just to say this slightly differently again, if you pick a point which is not fixed by a maximum torus, then there are holomorphic vector fields on X that won't lift to the blow up. So, these two automorphism groups won't agree. And there will therefore be a discrepancy between the mapping properties of the linearized operator before and after uh, blowing up. And you really want to see the blow up situation as a perturbation of the, of the situation before blowing up, but now the mapping properties don't match. So that's why you get uh, on the analytic side um, some, some issues. I so, suppose that the... Sorry, if you don't yeah. mind me interrupt. Yeah. Um, I suppose that the uh, presence of holomorphic vector fields makes extremal metric a more flexible. They, they, yeah. they allow for more flexibility in these metrics, right? Yes, I mean, you, you allow more flexibility. Um, um, that's true. So if you, if you did 
sort of the CECK problem, then um, then you would have even more uh, sort of um, obstructions to solving the thing. You can think about doing something like uh, changing the Kähler class instead of blowing up, which is an easier problem, like Hebrun Simanka. And there, if you start with a CCK matrix, but you have holomorphic vector fields, then there are kind of directions you could go uh, where um, you would admit extremal metrics that are not CSEK. So it, it's not true that in all directions you could uh, you could construct the CSEK metric. And in, in that situation, it's precisely captured by the classical Tutaki invariant, whether or not the uh, metrics you construct are CSEK. So it's kind of the same philosophy. There's uh, yeah. Um, if you want to solve the constant scalar curvature metric, you would like your linearized operator to have kernel or co-kernel the constants, but if there are holomorphic vector fields, then the co-kernel is bigger than that. So at the, at the linearized level, you can't solve the equation you're trying to solve, but you can solve this equation, which is determined by precisely the co-kernel you're having, and that's the extremal equation. And the philosophy is a bit the same here. There's going to be a discrepancy between what we see before and after blowing up. So we can solve everything modulo the things that are on X, but that's not really what you want to solve on the blow up. And that's why there's, there's an issue somehow. But maybe I will have time to say a few more words about that uh, later as well. Yeah, so, so this breaking or whatever of the, of the automorphism group, this discrepancy between the automorphism groups is really the core analytic reason for, for why you see some kind of obstruction. Um, maybe very quickly. Um, so the goal is to obtain some kind of geometric understanding of this obstruction. So when do we actually have a solution, um, despite the fact that it in general is obstructed? So from the Yatian Donaldson conjecture, you could guess at what the obstruction should be. It should be given by case stability. And there's kind of a natural candidate for what should constitute the obstruction. So I mentioned this algebra geometric work of Stoppa where he produced test configurations on the blow up from test configurations before blowing up. And the, the leading order term in this uh, numerical invariant that we have, the Donaldson to talk invariant on the blow up is the one you had before blowing up. And if you blow up, uh, a point that's not fixed, certain product test configurations will no longer be product. So uh, this is maybe for experts, but um, things that were allowed to have zero to talk invariant before are no longer allowed to have zero Donaldson to talk invariant. But the leading order term is still zero. So the, now the sub leading order term will matter, and it's these kind of test configurations that you should test on. Um, but that's maybe, maybe for those who know a bit more what case stability is. But uh, for the algebra, ge geom algebraic geometry is telling you what should constitute the obstruction to solving the equation. But the, the goal is then to kind of do this analytically, to bridge the gap between um, those things. Uh, and in Sakihidi's approach, uh, he, his, his approach allowed him to allowed him to relate the conditions on, on the point to case stability in this way. So in the in the CCK case, when X has dimension at least three, he showed that the blow up and it's a CCK metric if and only if the manifold is K polystable. So if you start with an extremal metric, then what's kind of remaining in full generality is the dimension two case and uh, the non-CSEK extremal case. Uh, and moreover, uh, he gave a, a finite dimensional GIT type condition that captures precisely what is needed to check k pole stability in this case. So it's, you don't need the full, um, full definition of k pole stability. There's really like these concrete test configurations that you need to test on and they are the ones I talked about in the previous slide. So the main result of my work with, with Rui is an extension of this to um, the, the non-CCK case and dimension two, and also to certain manifolds that themselves initially don't admit an extremal metric. Um, and that's an interesting case, especially for examples. 
So now I will state uh, state this uh, and some consequences, and then um, I will talk a bit about some aspects of the proof. Um, so the main result is uh, a Y to D type correspondence for the blow up of certain Kaler manifolds. So either we work in the setting of those previous constructions of Aritz Picard, Aritz Picard Singer, or Sekihidi, that is when X admits an extremal metric in, in omega, or we work, work on a small deformation of such a manifold. So X will be very close to having an extremal metric, but won't actually have an extremal metric um, itself. So collectively, we'll call those manifolds analytically relatively k semi-stable. Um, it's kind of a horrible uh, thing to, to, to say out loud. But uh, um, it implies the relative k semi-stability of x omega. And so it's a kind of analytic way of having this because you can, you can see your manifold as um, this new deformation of uh, something smooth that admits an extremal metric. Um, whereas in general, you would expect some kind of singular thing. Um, anyway, so the main result is that in, in those two cases, so if uh, X omega is analytically relatively case semi-stable uh, semi uh, and you pick a point on X and you consider the classes that we've been considering, then the existence of an extremal metric in these classes where the volume of the exceptional divisor is really small, is precisely captured by this um, algebra geometric criterion relative case stability. And moreover, this case stability criterion is really an explicit finite dimensional sort of condition um, in this case. So uh, it's precisely those type of test configurations that I was uh, mentioning before. So before talking about some aspects of the proof of this, um, I just want to mention some consequence. So there's this conjecture of Donaldson's, uh, which says that on any Kähler manifold, um, it might not admit an extremal metric or, or anything, but it, uh, even if it doesn't, you can find a collection of points on it so that if you blow up the manifold in those points, then the, the, that blow up uh, admits an extremal metric. That's a, a general conjecture due to Donaldson. And we show that for analytically semi-stable manifolds, you can always find a point where uh, in whose blow up we, we get an extremal metric. So the kind of um, criterion you need uh, in the obstruction can be satisfied for some choice of point. So um, yeah, we show that if you are analytically relatively k semi-stable, then you can find a point uh, so that the blow up admits an extreme electric in these classes. So um, in this, for these very special manifolds, there, there is a good point that we, one can use in this conjecture of those. This is far from giving any insight to how to solve this problem in general, but it solves it in a very special case. And moreover, the fact that we can find that point allows us to um, construct many new examples of extremal manifolds. So this relies on recent work by, by really many researchers, um, such as Pajita and Chelsov and, and really very many researchers who have worked on explicitly verifying case stability for final three faults. And in their work, um, uh, one finds many families admitting uh, strictly k semi-stable manifolds degenerating to a smooth k polystable central fiber. So a Kähler-Einstein central fiber. And for those examples, we, we can apply our construction. So um, uh, as a byproduct sort of, of their work, we, we get many examples uh, yielding extremal metrics on the, on the blower. And often the these semi-stable guys won't actually have any automorphisms, so often these metrics are actually CCK metrics. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say about the main result and some of the consequences, uh, and then I'll use the remaining time to talk a little bit about uh, some of the aspects of the proof, but maybe are there any questions now about, about the statement or, or anything? Uh, so when you mentioned the 
main result that the manifold is a deformation of a mat deformation mm -hmm. which has an extremal metric. So what do you mean by deformation there? Like so it's it's really you can you can think of a smooth manifold right where you have a let's say one parameter family of uh, almost complex structures okay. where you're where um parameterized by c or disk in c or whatever where over zero um you have an extremal manifold and then for all non-zero values you have the same uh by holomorphism class and it's okay. this this these non-zero values that you're interested in constructing an extremal metric on so they are they won't have it themselves but they are okay. infinitesimally close to to admitting one okay they're kind of infinitesimally yeah, close uh, to the to the central fiber right that makes sense um, thank you any other um questions All right, uh, I'll I'll go on then. So, um, I'll explain the core new idea. Um, so the core new idea is that we want to work with a fixed symplectic manifold in the gluing process, and instead let the complex structure vary. So in the beginning, I talked about this point of view where <coughs> you use functions to change the Cayley metric by changing the symplectic form. There's another way of using functions to change the metric by changing the almost complex structure instead. And we take that point of view. So um, when you blow up a complex manifold, the complex structure will depend on the point you choose. So uh, an easy example is blowing up three points in a line on P2 versus blowing up three points in general position. Those complex structures will be not be biholomorphic. But as, uh, as a smooth manifold, uh, it's always the same and in the symplectic category as well. So as a smooth manifold, the blow up is just a connected sum of M with CPN with the opposite orientation. Um, and so we're gonna think of it in, in this way that we're always having the same um, smooth manifold. We're always gonna pick the same point on that. And we're always gonna take the same symplectic form, but we're instead gonna let the almost complex structure vary. So that's what we want to put ourselves in the position of uh, initially. Um, and that will allow us to see everything as a perturbation of the situation when you blow up a fixed point of this torus action. Um, and that's the unobstructed case. So we want to see everything that we're doing as an ob uh, a perturbation of the, of the unobstructed case. So maybe uh, I'll, I'll be a bit quick. Uh, about this part, but what we do is that we first construct a symplectomorphism that take this fixed point to a nearby point uh, Q instead. So what we're really interested now is we should think that we're, we want to blow up Q and we're gonna make Q become P by applying some sort of diffeomorphism. And one can do that using uh, Moser's trick. So then we can, um, pull back the almost complex structure that we had to create a new almost complex structure J, uh, JQ and blowing up M with this new almost complex structure in P is the same as blowing up uh, the old almost complex structure in Q. So th the point is that we have applied some, we've constructed some sort of symplectomorphism that allows us to, to view blowing up in Q as blowing up in P just with a different almost complex structure. And that's, that's the thing we, we wanna, wanna do. We wanna always work with blowing up the same point P uh, no matter what, and then let uh, Q vary instead, uh, JQ vary instead with, with yeah. And uh, since this is a symplectomorphism, then the two Kähler manifolds we have before and after pulling back this um, almost complex structure is the same. So we're, we're kind of starting with the same sort of data, but we're, we're just having a different viewpoint on it. So now we can take the point of view that we are blowing up a fixed symplectic manifold in one given point, And what is changing is the almost complex structure, not the point. So we can encode that in a map. Q goes to JQ uh, from some 
ball in a vector space to to the space of almost complex structures compatible with our symplectic form. And I mean, once you have this point of view, you can even let the complex structure vary in that in that way that I was just dis discussing. Um, um, so we can even allow the kind of biholomorphism class to change a bit as well. Uh, and that's what allows us to tackle this sort of strictly semi-stable case. Okay. Okay, so, so we now have this um, way we're changing the almost complex structure instead of the point encoded in some kind of map. And it parameterizes the, the, the domain of the map parameterizes all nearby points to a fixed point by this action of the maximal torus and all nearby complex structure in the kind of current issue model. And um, by work of um, Sekihidi and, and Bromno, we can, we can do this in a way so that we ensure that the scalar curvature of the metric we get lands in the space of holomorphy potentials for when Q is equal to P. So this is, this is really only important here for this second situation where we're allowing the biholomorphism type to change that we can't necessarily solve the extremal equation but we can solve that the scalar curvature lands in the space of holomorphy potentials for the central fiber. So there's some sort of finite dimensional obstruction space that we can have the, the scalar curvature in. And that's a model for what we're going to do on the blow up as well. Uh, so that's actually the next step. So the next step in, in the approach uh, is that we divide the problem up into two more manageable bits. So if we directly try to solve the extremal equation, then we know we're going to run into problems. So instead, what we do is that we solve an easier equation first on the blow up, and then we analyze when we have actually solved the equation we wanted, which is the extremal equation after that. So yeah, we first solve a more general equation on the blow up than the extremal equation, and then we analyze when this more general equation actually solves the extremal equation. And this is sort of a, this is a strategy that um, uh, is really useful in these obstructed perturbation problems that you kind of solve everything that the linearization, oops, that the linearization is allowing you to solve. That's what we're going to solve in, in this step, first step. And then that's going to be easier than solving the equ equation you care about then you can try to analyze when you actually solve the equation you care about afterwards. So from, from the analytic point of view, this is a bit easier. You, you made the, well, the first step is easier anyway, but you, you're not solving the equation you care about. So you have to do something more. But, um, so I know this kind of strategy of dividing the problem up into two bits from ideas going back to at least Donaldson, but I'm, I'm sure it goes further back than that as well. So that's where I know it from. So the first step in our in the approach is to obtain a lift of this map we had before. So before we had a map from some uh, ball in a vector space parameterizing nearby points and nearby almost complex structures to the space of almost complex structures on M. And one could do that in a way so that the scalar curvature landed in this finite dimensional uh, space. And what we want to do is that we want to um, elevate this to the blow up. So we want to find for every Q and sufficiently small epsilon, an almost complex structure JQ epsilon on the blow up so that uh, the scalar curvature lands in um, H bar epsilon where these are the uh, lifts of these guys for the central fiber, meaning for when Q is equal to P. Um, so this is, I should say, this is the kernel of the linearized operator on the central fiber when Q is equal to P. So when Q is equal to P, that's the unobstructed case corresponding to blowing up an extremal manifold at a fixed point. And we're, we're going to solve for everything being in the kernel of that operator, which is what the linearization allows you to do, um, which is not the actual equation we want to solve, but it's an easier equation um, to solve. Um, so yeah, 
uh, omega epsilon is the symplectic form defined using using the earlier works that I mentioned. Um, so the advantage of of trying to do this of of working with sort of thinking of the symplectic manifold is as fixed is that now vector fields that don't correspond to holomorphy potentials on the on the fibers q not equal to p now now they actually have a natural length. So we can just use the one uh, for when Q is equal to P. Um, yeah, so there, there is a lifting procedure where you just use the one for the central fiber. Um, and the space of these lifted functions is precisely what you're seeing as the co-kernel of the linearized operator to leading order. So that's why solving, you know, prescribing the scalar curvature modulo these things um, is possible at the linearized level. <clears throat> but I should say that not all of these will be holomorphic potentials on the blow up. They're just some Hamiltonians, but they don't all produce holomorphic vector fields. Okay. So just to reiterate what the, the goal is, uh, in, in case I lost you a bit, we want to construct an almost complex structure on the blow up so that the scalar curvature lies in this finite dimensional space corresponding to the kernel of the linearized operator when Q is equal to P. And that might not be an extremal metric but after solving that equation, that's when we analyze when we have solved it and relate it to, to this algebra geometric criteria, case stability. So to, do the, to solve this equation, what we do is that we perform exactly the same construction as on the central fiber on the, on the non-zero fibers. And to actually solve the extremal equation, we need this scalar curvature to land in some sort of subspace of, of, this, um, of this space, but the point is that it's easier to solve S omega epsilon J epsilon Q in H bar epsilon than it is to solve the actual extremal equation. Um, so to do that, um, we start with our initial JQ that we almost complex structure to JQ that we constructed before blowing up. Um, we then apply Moser's trick a couple of times again. Um, to, to obtain an, a simple ectomorphism to this um, m omega epsilon that we always want to use. And if we then pull back the Cayley structure, we get an in initial approximate solution to, to this uh, equation. Um, and uh, really what we have is that the, the structure that we have is a perturbation of, of the one we have on the central fiber. And now we, we do the construction of Sekihidi um, in, in, in this whole family. Um, and we can then view it as a perturbation of the setup on the central fiber. Uh, and uh, we can solve this more general equation than, than the extremal equation. So at this point, we have um, not necessarily solved the, the extremal equation. And that's what we want to understand now. And the reason that this, is, this equation here is easier to solve than the one we're actually interested in solving is that we're solving kind of what the linearized theory is allowing us um, to solve. OK, so that kind of completes the outline of the, of the first step in the approach. So the second step in the approach um, is relating the construction to case stability and understanding when we have actually solved the equation that we wanted. So um, I only have like five minutes left, so I'll be, or four, so I'll be a bit brief about this step. But what we have is that we have um, parameterized all nearby points to Q and nearby complex structure by a ball in a vector space. We have solved this more general equation than the extremal equation. And now we want to understand when this actually lies in some sort of subspace. Um, floating around in this setup is some kind of uh, uh, action of a torus on this uh, ball. So what we actually want is not just to solve 
uh, this equation, we actually want to find when there is some other point in the same orbit as Q uh, that solves this equation. And the key to achieving this is that we can actually view this as looking for a zero or a critical point of a certain moment map. And so a, a key proposition is that the image of the map that we've constructed to the space of almost complex structures on the blow up, um, that image is a symplectic submanifold. And now the scalar curvature uh, is, a, is a moment map for the action of the Hamiltonian symplectomorphism group on the space of almost complex structure by Fajiki and Donaldson. And if we now project to the space, the obstruction space H epsilon, then this is a moment map for the restriction to this uh, torus that we have of, of that action. And then since we have a symplectic submanifold, um, this also then holds on the image of, of this embedding. So the upshot is that we have managed to put ourselves in a situation where solving the CCK or extremal equation becomes a sort of finite dimensional moment map problem. And that's what allows us to relate things to GIT or to uh, relative stability. So uh, just to briefly outline the, the remaining steps of the proof. So the functions <clears throat> in, in the space H or H epsilon induce test configurations for the blow up. So this was for known through work of Sakihiri. And now their Donson Fitaki invariant is precisely the value that you get out of the moment map that I, I just discussed. So the upshot is that the value of the moment map can be realized as the algebra geometric quantity that we wish to relate the construction to. And if you analyze the Hamiltonian functions, um, this um, produces another point in the same orbit as the, as the point Q we started with, uh, where the Hamiltonians uh, orthogonal to those that are holomorphic potentials vanish if we assume uh, case stability. And this is a technique due to Durban uh, in, a, in a different work. So assuming relative case stability, we get that the scalar curvature lies in the space of holomorphic potentials at the complex structure over this Q prime point. Uh, and that is saying that we produce an extremal metric under the assumption of relative case stability. So it lies in this finite dimensional subspace um, of this um, construction space, which is what we wanted. Um, so the final thing I want to say is just that um, we can also obtain explicit expansions that give the exact criterion for stability in this case. This is really an explicit expansion of holomorphy potentials or donaldson Pitaki invariants. And this uses really similar ideas to the analogous statements in the work of, um, of Sekihidi. Um, but yeah, uh, the, the key is really to land ourselves in this, uh, in this point where we can, uh, in the situation where we can think of it as a sort of finite dimensional, um, mo zero of the moment map type problem. Okay, um, so yeah, sorry that the end was a bit rushed there, but that's what I wanted to say. So thank you for the attention. Thank you, Lars. Thank you. And uh, so I'm going to 